Are you a family caregiver? Are you caregiving for someone who can no longer take care of themselves? Are you overwhelmed? This is Caregiver Solutions Info with Marsha Teal. Marsha will be hosting an hour of true stories and information, tips and updates of the latest research and necessary information in the caregiving field, focusing on you, the family caregiver. An Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert, Marsha has 15 years of hands-on experience at Arden Courts, a leader in assisted living dementia communities here in the U.S. Marsha covers everything you need to know as a family caregiver, especially if you care for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease or other related dementia or chronic illness. If you have a friend or relative that is also a family caregiver, call them now. They won't want to miss a minute. And let them know they can watch on caregiversolutions.info. And they can listen on WNN 1470 AM in South Florida or nationally on the iHeartRadio app. Now, sit back, relax, and learn from our host, Marsha Teal, as she brings information to you that may just be the caregiving solution you need. Hi, and welcome to Caregiver Solutions Info. I'm Marcia Teal, and I'm so glad that you could join us today. We have another great show for you, and this is the show for you, the caregiver, the family caregiver. If you're caring for someone that has dementia, Alzheimer's, some memory problems, or you know someone that is doing that, then this show is for you and for them. So please let them know and tune in, whether you're listening to us on the radio or watching us live on your web we are here for you the show is full of information we have experts in the field of various topics that are related to caregiving elder law attorneys geriatric care managers nurses social workers but most importantly we also have caregivers people that have walked in your shoes who know what you're going through, who've been there, who've done that, and can give you a wealth of information. So you want to not miss one single show because it's really, really important to get the education and to get that support that you need as a family caregiver. So I'm glad that you're with us today. Today is Tuesday, January 26, 2016. Now every week we usually do a brain booster but I want to tell you about something that's going to boost your brain. One of the things we talk about is education. Education is very, very important for caregivers. I mean, there's lots of things you can do to educate yourself about the caregiving process. Um, of course, this show is one of them. There's lots of books. There's seminars. There's uh, conferences that you can go to. And by educating ourselves and learning something new, we're actually exercising our brain and expanding our knowledge and knowledge as you know as they say is power and so you're going to be more powerful in your caregiving efforts by educating yourself so two things I want to offer you today take a pencil write this down one of them is here right here in South Florida it is the educational conference every year that's put on by Alzheimer's Community Care it is awesome it's a wealth of information. They bring guest speakers in from all over the country, experts in the field, all kinds of neurologists, researchers. I want you to know that the next one coming up is 2016, March 17th and 18th at the Palm Beach County Convention Center in West Palm Beach, Florida. This is a wonderful conference for caregivers and professionals alike to come and learn and share with each other. There's breakout sessions and you have your choice of going to different topics, learning different things, all kinds of topics ranging from uh, planning to uh, guardianship to learning about how do I deal with my um, loved one's behavior because he wants to wander out of the house, all kinds of things to learn there. And so you want to uh, check this out because it's real real good for caregivers and you know invite your family to come sometimes you know we forget that Alzheimer's disease is a family disease because it affects everyone even if you have a family member that's not directly taking care of that loved one and it may, mostly falls on your shoulders your family needs to be educated about what you're going through because the caregiver has a, a, a real burden and it's sometimes forgotten about the other extended families knowing how to take care of that caregiver. So we want to care for the caregiver also. 
So I want to encourage you to check that out. Uh, you can go to the website, owls.org, learn more information about that. We'll be uh, giving more information out about the conference as it gets closer. But mark it on your calendar, March 17th and 18th in the West Palm Beach Convention Center. Also, for educational purposes, uh, we want to offer you the 36-hour day book. Art and Courts is one of our national sponsors. And as a national sponsor, not only are they an expert in the field of caregiving for people with memory loss, but they also are great about educating the caregivers. And they'd like to give this free book to you, The 36-Hour Day. It's been very popular. Um, we have a lot of calls about the book uh, from our show. And this is the fifth edition. And all you have to do is call the Arden Courts toll-free number, and we're going to give you that uh, number later in the show so stay tuned have a pencil ready so you can jot that number down but you have a conference you have some educational tools and you have this program so all that being said we hope that you continue to watch share listen and learn and when we come back from a short commercial break we're going to be talking about guardianship what it is how, what it means do i need it and when do i need it and how do you go about that process? So you don't want to miss this really good educational show. And we'll be back in just a few minutes. Stay tuned. Arden Courts is not just a place to live. It's a place to call home. Residential living combined with quality caregiving. This is the philosophy behind Arden Courts. Communities created exclusively for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia who would benefit from a safe and structured environment. For additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides, call 888-478-2410 to locate a community nearest you. Inquire about our educational seminars, resource library, or support groups, or simply feel free to ask questions you may have about Alzheimer's and related dementias. At Arden Courts, we know, we understand, and we can help because memory care is all we do. Remember, Call 888-478-2410 for additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides. Make First Choice your first choice for home health care. First Choice is state certified for Medicare covered services such as medical treatment and rehabilitation. Qualified health care professionals come to your home and work closely with your doctor to build a care plan designed to get you back on your feet as soon as possible. Founded and operated by registered nurses, First Choice Home Health is dedicated to providing exceptional home health care. Their highly skilled medical professionals have the knowledge and ability to provide patients quality care. Call First Choice Home Health at 561-296-2770. That's 561-296-2770. And tell them you want them as your first choice. You are listening to your host, Marsha Teal an Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert on caregiversolutions.info. If you have a question or wish to share a story, call into the show at 888-565-1470 and talk with Marcia. Now, back to Caregiver Solutions. And welcome back to Caregiver Solutions Info. I'm here with a really special person. Not only um, is Karen a professional guardian and she has lots of things under her name she's um, been someone that I've worked with for many years in the community and I've asked her to come here today to um, help us understand about guardianship guardianship is something that you may or may not have heard of you may or may not need it as a family caregiver what are the circumstances and so I've asked Karen to come and join us she is not only a professional guardian but she's a nurse care manager. She's the president of the Palm Beach County Guardianship Association, and she also sits on the board of the Florida Guardianship Association. So hi, Karen, and welcome. Good afternoon. Happy New Year. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you're here because, you know, of anybody, you're the perfect person to share your knowledge, your wealth of experience, because, you know, you've been doing this for quite some time. You're an expert 
um, on guardianship, uh, the president of the, the, the Palm Beach County guardianship, and you sit on the board for Florida. I mean, that's a lot. That's a big undertaking. And uh, Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I want to congratulate you for, for achieving that, but also thank you in advance for all the things that you do as a guardian. Thank you very much. It's um, with strong feelings that I sit on those boards, and I try to advocate for those who don't have a voice. Well, that's what we want to talk about, because we want to find out from you first, if you'll tell our listeners, what is guardianship, what does it mean, and why would somebody even need a guardianship? So tell me a little bit about what a guardian does and why they might come into the picture. Well, usually it's a situation where the person cannot make a decision for themselves. They've been deemed incapacitated or there's an alleged incapacity, um, and then that galvanizes. Now, if you have not been proactive in taking care of your documents, your powers of attorney, your health care surrogates, then that leaves you in a place where there's no one that can advocate for you legally. So you want to make sure that you take care of those documents early on. Uh, we'll, we'll, I guess, go back to that. So leading to guardianship, um, there are many scenarios that get you to that point, and it doesn't mean that you have to be an elderly person. I, I work with a person in the past who had a fall in his home. He was unconscious and in a coma. His sisters became co-guardians and worked with him for several years, um, in that capacity. So they had to advocate for him on his mental, on his legal, on his medical, um, all of his financials. There are different guardianships. There is a plenary guardianship, which is a guardianship of a person and the property. So it's a, a complete guardianship. So so let me let me ask you a question. So a guardian is somebody who basically holds the fate of another person in their hand because they're the ones that make all the decisions for a person who's not able or not willing or incapable for some reason Correct. to make decisions about their whole life. Correct. It's a very responsible role. Um, morally and ethically, you have to try to step in and use substitute a judgment and do what they would want, not necessarily what you would choose for you or your family, but what they would choose for themselves. So you try to gather information uh, being a guardian is being court appointed. You have to take a 40-hour course and take a state test and pass a background check and maintain your continuing education hours every year and be licensed and bonded within the state or bonded within the state and continue your certification. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of oversight. We have um, an initial plan that has to be approved by the judge. There's a yearly plan that has to be approved by the court. They look at if you're the guardian of the property, there's an accounting that has to be done whoa, yearly. Whoa, whoa, this is, this is, you are rattling all this stuff and it's like, what? what? It's very responsible. Is, you know, people hear about a guardian, but look, there's so much to this. And, and I, I'm glad that you're, you're here to explain this because I think that um, people do not take it seriously when we encourage them right. all the time get your legal documents in place and as you mentioned before people that don't have a durable power of attorney where they've given another person the authority to make medical decisions through a health care proxy or make legal decisions through a durable power of attorney and make some financial decisions and they don't have that they don't have a living will in place and they right. just for whatever reason they put it off they they think it costs too much money they don't want to do it it's they procrastinate or there's a fear or that something could happen and almost but like, things happen. <laughs> you well, have to be prepared. Right. But it's almost like what you're saying, a self-fulfilling prophecy that they right. feel like, well, you know, if I give somebody my power, all of a sudden something's going to happen to me and they're going to have to execute it. And I don't want that to happen. So they live in denial. And, right. and that's a terrible place to be. So let's assume that people, uh, for whatever reason, any of those reasons, they do not have legal documents. Right. right. And something does happen, and now there is nobody to step in. Let's 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 take a couple scenarios here, because I really want to explain the difference between a professional guardian and a um, maybe a family type of guardian. Correct. Okay. And there are family guardians. There's two different kinds. Mm -hmm. So let's go with the family guardian first, right? Okay. So let's say that something does happen, like you mentioned, the man who fell down, right? Right. And he became unconscious, and he needed someone to make decisions, and he was not married, correct? Actually, he was married, but his wife had some health issues, advanced dementia. Okay. And 
So she was um, not able to step into that role, and they have a young son at the time. He was underage. So there were so many dynamics that went on. All right, so now the wife can't help because she's right. incapacitated with memory loss. The son mm. is too young. He's not of legal age. Correct. So this man luckily had two sisters, and then you said they became co-guardians Correct. over him. Now, for a professional guardian, there's a 40-hour course. Now, for a family guardian, it's an 8-hour course. So if someone's going to be a family guardian, they actually have to go to school for this? They have to take a course. They do. Really? Right, and... They are subject to the same um, oversight that a professional guardian yeah, is subject to. Yeah, and we're going to get into that detail. So how is it handled? Because obviously this is a crisis situation, it right? Is. There's a medical um, situation going on. And right. you can't just, you know, take your time about creating um, a plan for someone to step in and do that. So in a family situation where there are people willing to step up and say, okay, I'll help. I'll be the one to take over and make those decisions for my brother, for instance. Right. right? So how and does it's that so happen? so hard for you to step in. I have a brother, and we have that brother-sister relationship. He's not going to want me to come in and say, okay, now you have to live in this place because this other place isn't safe for you anymore. There's no understanding of that. You've always been either the kid's sister or the older sister, and I don't want to listen to you. So, it's so a even difficult in a family place. situation, the, the person who can and is able to step in actually might not even be the one you would want to right. because maybe you have some past history. Exactly. Maybe you're, maybe you're the kind of siblings that, you know, you fought all right. your life or you know you didn't really get along and Correct. maybe this is their chance to get back at you because hey right mom treat, loved you more mom okay. loved you more you mm-hmm. treated me bad you pulled my hair when i was a little girl and right. now guess what you're going to pay for this because <laughs> i'm going to be in charge and i'm going to be the one that put you in this nursing home or i'm going to be the one that decides what's going to nine five four six six eight two five one zero nine five four the man who had the two sisters hopefully the two sisters were were good sisters and they didn't have good sister bad sister maybe they did because you said that they were co-guardians so now we don't have just one we have two right why two people that have to be on the same page with every decision making and why are there sometimes two um sometimes to divide the duties you know, it gets uh, a little overwhelming for people, especially if they are not, that is not their profession to step into this role that can be overwhelming with selling property, with managing medical issues, with, you know, being local versus being out of town. One sister lived out of state, one sister lived across the coast. So, you know, there, there are people that can be here quicker to deal with more critical situations right. and make health care decisions. And then there are people that you know, might be more versed. Maybe they have more of a financial background, so they would be more capable in handling that. So whoever has maybe the qualifications? You try. You try, okay. and that works um, the best. And and so in this case, the the fella had two, had two sisters that had to agree, right, had to come together and agree. Now, that in itself can be impossible sometimes because what if they don't agree? It was difficult. What happens if they don't agree about, let's say, brother has to go into a nursing home and one feels that he can be managed at home and the other one feels no he has to go to a nursing home what happens when they disagree what kind of problems does that create and how does it get resolved you know in the world of guardianship um typically everyone has a lawyer um so the the person who is either the alleged incapacitated person or the person who has not been declared incompetent yet typically has their own attorney appointed by the state Oh, right, so um, you don't have court. to use your own or get your own, but you actually get one Someone's appointed. appointed to okay. you, correct. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the people that are the guardians or the proposed guardians or an emergency temporary guardian, because sometimes th- that happens as well, where you have somebody that's put in place in an emergency situation, and that situation's resolved within three months, and then the guardianship goes away. Um, or they've resolved whatever issues have happened, and they were able to reclaim their their independence and their capacity so so it can be short-lived it can be mm-hmm. or it could be for the rest Forever. of your life depending upon the situation correct okay so in in this situation each sister had a guardian uh, each sister rather had an attorney and then that attorney you know would discuss things with the other attorney and and then there are billable hours and you know can 
get very expensive very quickly. So you really want to try to make sure that everybody's on the same page, um, starting with making sure that everyone knows what your wishes are in case something happens. You know, yes, I would like this to happen, and please don't do that to me. I'd really like this to happen, mm-hmm. and, and I would hate if this happened. So, you know, that way your wishes are known. And, and you know, it's so important that we're talking about this because if you're a caregiver out there and you are taking care of someone with dementia, right? right? What happens if you're the one that becomes incapacitated first? Your spouse who has dementia is not going to be able to make those decisions, even if you have given him or her the power years ago. Correct. Now Alzheimer's or, or some other dementia has set in place, um, or maybe even if it's um, some other kind of physical thing that they can't think clearly. It doesn't always right. have to be dementia, but there's reasons why your spouse can no longer fulfill the duties that you originally gave them. Correct. But I like to talk about the dementia and Alzheimer's because that's what my passion is. Absolutely. And- well, I have a scenario exactly like that. Um, I have a gentleman who I became the guardian for a few years ago, and his companion, longtime friend, um, they were together, they lived together, they were in a relationship, and they never had children. You know, back then it was a shunned thing, so they really didn't have big circles of people. They never had children together, obviously. We would have been, um, you know, so there was no one to advocate for him when his companion passed. He was the one that had dementia and was very confused and wanted to leave with the car every day. Um, he was missing many a times, and then when, when his person passed, there was no one to advocate. So his nephew, the, the person's nephew, stepped in and said, I, I need somebody to help because I'm, I don't have any legal authority. There's no one that has legal authority. He didn't have any family. Right. So, so I became a, guardian. Okay. So then you were appointed as the guardian o- over this person. Correct. See, and it can happen. We don't realize. In the blink of an eye. In the blink of an eye. We don't realize. So, so if, you're, if you're taking care of someone with dementia, you know, you're like any good caregiver, worried about them and making sure that they're okay and getting right. what they need and taking care of that. But you got to think about what would happen if something happened to you. God forbid you were in a car accident. Or Even if you couldn't be home, you know, if, if there was, you know, you slipped and fall on a piece of ice that melted on the floor on that wet marble tile, mm-hmm. and now you're in a hospital, you're in a facility, you're in a rehab, and you can't be there to take care of. You need to have things in place so that everyone is, is safe. Right, right, right. And especially if you aren't able to make decisions. Because, mm-hmm. you know, you can you can pick up a phone and you can call people and you can have your plan in place. But if you're not able to talk and you're not coherent and you're unconscious, you're not going to be able to make those phone calls. And so you need to have that backup plan. So it's very, very important because we need to take care of all the scenarios and all the pictures. And that's why we bring this information to you. It's to create awareness. And with awareness, then we can do what we need to do to go to the next step to make sure, because if you have a plan in place, and I know (laughs) you deal with this every day. I know you do. You live it like I do. If you have a plan, as a caregiver, you're going to feel so much more relaxed as and far empowered. as and empowered and mm-hmm. it's going to reduce your stress level. It's going to reduce your anxiety level because you know what? Okay, I'm okay now, but if something happens, I know what my plan is. That's right. I know what my backup is and I know what I'm going to do. Without that plan, without a backup, you're a fish out of water and you know, you're going to get eaten up by the big sharks because you know, you have nothing to to help you. Um, it, it's like going down the river without a paddle and you're at the mercy of the raging river, not knowing what rocks you're going to crash into and your, your boat's going to overturn. So a plan is so important. So that's why we're talking about this, to, about this today. Um, so going back to the gentleman whose sisters were the co-guardians, uh, what if they just can't agree and now you've got the two lawyers and they're, what, they're talking to each other and like you said, they're racking up high attorney bills and they can't agree what's a, a a recourse they can have do they have available to them to go to some kind of mediation you know they they are doing that now there's some um, there's mediations that are happening um you know we're trying to alleviate the stress off of the court system yes not everything needs to go before a judge um also the alleged incapacitated person or the the 
person who now is called a ward okay they're can new, they have a new title now right if they are working with their past attorney they can request to have that attorney put back on their case and work with them again to advocate for them again to maybe help bring peace to the two that maybe are, are in conflict yeah. Um, It's always better to just have one guardian that way. There's one decision maker. It's really difficult to get two people on the same page all the time. Well, it's funny you said that because I'm working um, with a guardian now, Mm -hmm. and he has been appointed. He's the one in charge um, of this. um, It's not even a relative. It's, It's like a disconnected relative, maybe three times removed from in laws, outlaws. I mean, it's really not even a family member. But he's trying to please the family. So he's been appointed to make the decisions, but he feels a little bit uneasy because he's got two people that are closer to the ward, Mm -hmm. and he's trying to please them both. Neither one of them were capable of being the guardian, but now he is, and he's having a really hard time. Well, if I do this, this one will be mad. If I do this, this one will be mad. And so even when someone does get appointed as a guardian, it's really not a slam dunk because there's a lot of emotions involved. Yes, very much. Uh, relationships and, you, you know, have tons of history, lots, right. of, lots of emotion. Um, again, I go back to it's substituted judgment. That person needs to go with what the ward would have done. Not what the sister would do, not what the mom would do, because moms are way different than, you know, even children. You have lots of different emotions, and it's a totally different dynamic. So that's the key. What would this person want? Try to always go back to that. And go back. Did did they tell us something years ago? Is there anything written down? You know, what was their lifestyle? Is this exactly. is this what they would have liked or would they not be comfortable with that? So that's really the key there. Right. It's those... investigating. It's being a detective mm-hmm. to get to know the person that you're trying to advocate for, uh, whether you are a family guardian or whether you're not. Maybe you've been disassociated from that family for years. Correct. You know, you, you could might be, be out of state and, you know, living drifted relative, away. Right? Correct. But, but you don't really know. And you're willing to take it on. But now you really don't know anything about this person. You live with them for maybe the first 20 years of their life. But now for the last 40, you haven't seen them or rarely spoken to them. Right. And, and you're, that's and, a whole different dynamic. And you're flying by your coattails. Right. And that's not a, a comfortable place to be. Wow. So there's so much involved with this, and I'm so glad you're here. Thank We're you. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, Karen's going to share with us a lot more about what we need to know about guardianship. So stay tuned. Need the advice of an elder law attorney, but perhaps find it difficult or overwhelming getting to appointments? The solution is the Elder Law Department. They bring elder law to you by meeting with you in the comfort of your own surroundings to discuss your personal situation and family needs. In practice since 1994, Heidi Friedman is a member of the Elder Law section of the Florida Bar. She and her team help families with issues that include incapacity and estate planning, asset preservation, veterans benefits, and other legal issues that seniors may face. Call the Elder Law Department at 955 954- Four three eight three one one four three nine five four three eight three one one four three. They bring elder law to you. Make first choice your first choice for home health care. First Choice is state certified for Medicare covered services such as medical treatment and rehabilitation. Qualified health care professionals come to your home and work closely with your doctor to build a care plan designed to get you back on your feet as soon as possible. Founded and operated by registered nurses. First Choice Home Health is dedicated to providing exceptional home health care. Their highly skilled medical professionals have the knowledge and ability to provide patients quality care. Call First Choice Home Health at 561-296-2770. That's 561-296-2770. And tell them you want them as your first choice. You are listening to your host, Marsha Teal, an Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert on caregiversolutions.info. If you have a question or wish to share a story, call into the show at 888-565-1470 and talk with Marsha. Now, back to Caregiver Solutions. Hi, and welcome back to Caregiver Solutions. I'm Marsha Teal, and with me, my guest today is Karen Green. Karen is a professional guardian. She's the president of the Palm Beach County Guardianship Association. She has her own company. She 
sits on the board of the Florida State Guardianship Association. So her credentials are uh, here for you to learn. And we've been talking, Karen, um, about guardianship and and when somebody might need it and what they need to know. And it really gets involved, doesn't it? It is. And, you know, it can be temporary. It can be just for a few months as an emergency temporary guardian. You can have a guardianship that lasts for, you know, a year or two. And rights can be restored. Um, every year when we do our annual plan, there can be a reevaluation by the doctors to see if rights should be restored. Uh, you always want to go with least restrictive environment and least restrictive all the way around. So, so that's what we live by. And you learn that. You mentioned there's a course. So yes. if you're a family guardian, we talked about that, you have to go through an eight-hour course. And right. what are some of the things that you're going to learn when you go through that course? Well, the statute, um, what you can do, what you can't do, the rules to live by. Um, there are questions, you know, a lot of people step into this without any knowledge. So, you know, they're just living their life um, being a teacher and they have no idea how to manage property or what's expected of them. And um, so there's basic general things that are taught to you. Uh, a lot of it is just, you know, ethical and moral and making the right decisions for the right reasons. You know, we have the obligation of sometimes making a life and death decision, surgical decisions, medication decisions, um, trial studies, you know, whether you want someone to be a part of that or not. Um, so it, much, so much to know. Correct. Now, let me ask Placement, you. Placement, you know, if you're relocating that person from their home to a skilled nursing or assisted living facility, is that the right placement? You know, what they would like, religious aspects. But it's not only just making the decisions. It sounds like as a guardian, you have to coordinate all that. Yes. You have to set the set things in motion to make it happen and make mm -hmm. sure it does happen. You have to oversee everything. You have to make the contacts. You have to make the calls. I mean, you... It's a lot of phone it, time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. And, and if someone, like you said, is a teacher and all of a sudden they're thrown into this, right. um, that's not a paid position either, is it? A family guardian, no. You, sometimes they can get a small stipulation for their time and their reimbursements. But, you know, it, it's overwhelming. It, it could be a full-time job just dealing with one family member on top of whatever other responsibilities you have. If you're a mom and you have two small children, and you're also working a full-time 40-hour week plus job because whoever works 40 hours a week anymore, it doesn't happen. Right. And, you know, you have responsibilities. It's really difficult to deal with a crisis in the middle of the afternoon. So so take that situation. Mm -hmm. So what if that person who's the mom and the worker and has the kids and, and all of a sudden, you know, Aunt Sally ends up, you know, needing her as to be the guardian? What if the guardian, that appointed guardian, who's a family member, mm -hmm. says, I can't handle this. I can't deal with Aunt Sally. I don't have time. I'm too overwhelmed. I don't want this job. Now, can they give it up? They can. As a matter of fact, I became a successor guardian um, in, in two such scenarios. So it's called um, one, a successor guardian. Correct. One where a um, a son was not able to do it anymore. You know, he's in his 30s. He's on the brink of starting his, his career and his life and building. And he lives out of state. And his mom is here. She's fairly young, in her 60s. And so there is many years ahead. And the relationship dynamic between mother and son is different than a professional relationship that I would have. Right. Because we're more peers rather than... Mother child. Right. And so, you know, she and I have been able to get along very well, and I think the son is much relieved, and he gets to be the son again. He gets to enjoy his mother at at his relationship level instead of having to say, well, Mom, you have to move out of your house now because, you know, things have changed. So it almost so. becomes like, like you're as the person making those hard decisions, and if right. it's something that's a really difficult decision that you have to tell the mom – then you get to be the bad guy in a way because so say, the, right. in a way because the son doesn't have to make those decisions and so I said well it's not me mom this is you know unfortunately this well, is well it's the fear it's I don't want mom to be mad at me mm -hmm. you know I don't mm -hmm. want her to hate me if I tell her that she has to leave her home because it's not financially feasible anymore or she needs you know more if care. she's not safe and you know there mm -hmm. there are risk factors so. You know, it's not that I'm the bad guy, but I'm not as emotionally vested. She can be mad at me. That's we can have conversation about it, and hopefully she'll resolve her feelings for me.
but she's not then angry at her son, and it who preserves, is always going to be her son. Right, and exactly. it preserves that relationship. Exactly. And that's, that's very important, you know, to, to have that so. relationship, not to yeah. be... And you know, God damaged. forbid if my mother needs help because there's no way that I could step into that guardianship role for her. It, it would just be too difficult, you know, to make those decisions for somebody that you love so much. I mean, you have to if you do, mm-hmm. but if you can't, you know, if you can avoid it, it's certainly a better way to go. Okay, so we know now that they can give that up if they need to. Yes. Um, and that's when you as a professional guardian comes into play as a successor. But yes. sometimes you are court appointed from the get go. I am. And so how does that happen? Does somebody call you up and say, Karen, you know, we need a guardian. You're it. I mean, how does that work? Sometimes. um, I was in a a case last summer that started off where there was a question. um, The daughter was the emergency temporary guardian. There was already questions about maybe some inappropriate spending. And so at the court hearing, there was conversation of maybe we need to get a professional in so that there's no question. And I was, my name was thrown out there along with, I think, two others. And it was determined that I would be the court appointed guardian of the property. Okay. Of the property. Of which the means property. It, somebody else was going to be in charge of the person. Right. So she would make medical decisions. So mm-hmm. she retained the right to be the emergency temporary guardian uh, for the person. Okay. I took over as guardian of the property, and then subsequently, um, she's made some other bad choices, uh, I feel, you know, and things that the court didn't agree with. And so this past December, I was made guardian of the person and the property, so I became a plenary guardian. What does that mean? That means guardian of person and property. So now I have full right to um, to make medical decisions, health care decisions, resident decisions, decisions of who she socializes with. Um, you know, these are these are rights whether she votes or not. You know, these are rights that are either taken away by the court and then I get to determine for her. I and mean, the right to vote is decided by the court. Does she have the capacity to make a decision on that? Driver's license, apply for benefits. Wow. You know, so these even are things. who she socializes with. Yes. So you're allowed to say so-and-so can't visit. Because well, sometimes me- you have somebody who's been taking advantage, right? There's a neighbor down the street who's you know, has you writing checks to them daily or weekly, and you know that person is really not an appropriate person for them. If the judge determines and the and the um, there's an examining committee that's appointed to do the assessment, so if those three people come back and say Sally can't make decisions for herself on who she socializes with, then I have the right to say to that person, Joe Schmo down the street, Stay away from Sally because, you know, I, I don't want you here anymore. It's mm-hmm. a detriment to Sally. Right. So you have to protect them. Yes. And, 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 and more that's ways, what this is all about. Right. Protecting right. the person more ways than the one. The vulnerable. Right. They are vulnerable. Mm-hmm. We had yes. um, a case that, you know, I got involved in where um, a cute little lady was being abused financially right. by some neighbors, just like you said, taking her to the bank and withdrawing money. Yes. And uh, there was a niece, but she wasn't nearby. Right. And she didn't know anything about this right. until one day, thank goodness, the bank officials called the niece and said, um, you know, your aunt is here with her neighbors. Right. And they want They've been in here five times this week <laughs> cashing checks. And they want to close her account now. Right. Right. And, you know, the, the bank's which, you know, I used to be in banking years ago, um, and we learned that we have a fiduciary responsibility to Correct. protect our our clients, our customers, too. So if we see that we feel that someone is being um, neglected, abused some in some way, you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility to report that. Correct. Now, there are also circumstances where people are cautious about making that call because they don't want to be wrong. Mm-hmm. They don't want to be under the scrutiny. They don't want the the issues with maybe their supervisors. Why did you make that call? You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have gotten involved. But it's very important. I had the same scenario with a gentleman years ago. The caregivers took almost his last dollar. And the nephew knew he had contacted me a while ago. And I said, well, you, you really need to do this. And 
you know, he wasn't sure. He didn't want to upset his uncle. Why are people who was so, so close afraid to, that to speak up? You know, it just it makes me so angry because people suspect. And OK, and OK, if I'm mm-hmm. wrong, I'm wrong. I'll apologize. Right. But it could be saving somebody. You well, know, in saving- the end, he was left with about forty thousand dollars. We had to move him out of his home because he couldn't afford to live there anymore with the amount of care that he needed. He had to move into a facility and ended up on Medicaid because this woman had taken all of the money. And even though there was then a police report and she was brought up on charges, she ended up dying before anything happened, and it's very difficult to recover the money. That's sad. So that's it is so sad. sad. So he suffered because the nephew didn't want to step on toes and upset the uncle, and, and it was a shame. But, yeah, banks are great people to see it firsthand. They mm-hmm. see the money coming out of the accounts, the same caregivers coming in, mm-hmm. someone who is... Um, Maybe they they have a visual incapacity. They're they're blind or they're visually impaired or they're hearing impaired. Um, you know, and they build a trust and a relationship with people who can take advantage. And and I think that if if there's adult children out there and they mm-hmm. have elderly parents and you know they're getting on in years and you know maybe some mild cognitive impairment is set in mm-hmm. and they're they have poor judgment and they're not you know, the best at remembering things and, and they're, they're vulnerable. Okay. They're vulnerable. I think that the adult children really need to contact the bank officials and say, look, I'm the son. I live in New York, but if you ever see my mom and she's doesn't seem right, or, you know, she's coming in with somebody that seems to be fishy to you, here's my number. Give me a call. I mean, don't you think that would be very helpful to um, officials to say, all right, at least we can call the son and report something. Exactly. And and I think everybody should do that. It's better to be proactive than to be reactive. Exactly. I think that's so important. Exactly. So now you're the professional guardian and you're making these decisions and it, I'm sure, takes up all your time because, um, you know, people are people and yes. it's a 20, Boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a 24 hour a day Absolutely. job, seven days a week because People have needs, people have wants, people have circumstances. And so it's almost like you're on call all the time. That must I th- am. That must be hard. Absolutely. Uh, the phone is by my bed and it's answered by me uh-huh. at night. Oh, well, any of the time. Yeah. The phone is always forwarded to And me. it's not just, you know, making those decisions, but you mentioned earlier about reports. Now, if yeah. you're whether you're a professional guardian or whether you're a family guardian, you have to report to the court because the court oversees all of this. So what kind of things do you have to do as far as reporting? You have an annual accounting. You have to provide them with all of the the, the financial statements, the, the accountings, they balance it down to a penny. So, you know, you want to make sure that everything is above board and everything is explained. When you want to make a purchase for your ward, you really should have a court approved, um, agreement you know that the the judge says it's okay you have to go in and petition and have a signed petition that it's all right for little things let's say she needs a a, a big screen tv that's going to cost a thousand (laughs) dollars maybe get an order okay you want an order but you're allowed to go out and buy you know new slippers or things like that or typically you you would put into your standing orders um general needs like you know spending money if they want to go to a movie you don't want to have that approved each and every time so you know, pocket money, spending money, grocery money, uh, money for an aid, however many hours you need that for. There are standard things that you know, like, mm-hmm. okay, Joe is not going to spend more than $100 a week on entertainment and groceries. So we want to make sure that he has pocket money because you want to make sure that they can continue to live. Right. And they don't feel like they're being stifled because that's never good. Right. So you keep receipts for everything yes. and then you have to report yes. all this on, a, is it an annual basis or a monthly basis? Annual, right. Okay. There's an initial where you have to do your accounting the first you know, few months and within 90 days you have to get that in and then there's your yearly plan. Okay. So you have specific bank accounts. Sometimes there are specific depository accounts where the money is put into that and then there's a court order a standing order that Mm -hmm. goes into effect where you can pay bills every month so then you transfer x amount of dollars into another checking account so there's minimal exposure for that person Mm -hmm. and only a small amount of money is available for check writing okay speaking of money i know we always hate to get to this part but hey you you have to you have to ask you know i know you this is a big job for you, and, mm-hmm. you know, this is your living. Yes. So the way you get paid, is it through the ward's financial situation that the court decides 
you know, how much you get and and the ward actually their financial um, assets um, are, are um, allocated to you whatever the court decides. Is that sort of how it works? Correct. You know, certainly not every guardianship um, person, every ward has money. So sometimes you take a case on for free. Okay. That's Um, that's what I wanted you to talk about too because it's called pro bono. Correct. And pro bono means that you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart. Yes. Because this person is... Has no one. Has no one. With no financial resources. Has nothing. Correct. Right? Has... Nothing. Right. And somebody has to step up to the plate and somebody has to care and somebody has to say, I'll do that. Correct. And, of course, you take pro bono cases occasionally, too. Correct. um, And as do most other. Does the court require a professional guardian to take so many pro bono cases? No, you know, each court district is a little different. Um, Broward County is a little different than Palm Beach County and also their fee structure because, you know, there are cases where we can get paid. Um, typically, not typically, um, the judge approves your fees. You know, there there's a petition to the judge to approve how much you get paid, and it's gone over by the judge, and he decides or she decides whether that's an appropriate charge, and then they'll grant your fees. The attorney also has their fees that they're billing for. So in Broward County, there is a cap of $85 an hour. And in Palm Beach County, typically it's $95 an hour. Now, um, non-for-profit companies can usually stretch that to $125 an hour. But, you know, there there is a cap and there's a governor that, you know, there's somebody looking at that determining whether you can be paid that amount or not. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that only because you just brought up another topic or another type of guardian besides a family and besides an individual which is court appointed right you mentioned a um, community guardian or a well there's the guardian at litem there's um the non-for-profit company so the non catholic in palm beach county we have catholic charities and we have um jewish family services. Jewish family services and they do a wonderful job you know, they, they do charge if there's assets, mm-hmm. they bill for them. And if there are no assets, then they get grant money that allows them to do that. So and groups or organizations can correct. also be guardians over a person. Correct. Okay. Very correct. good to know. Wow. Yeah, this... There are resources out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Monarch Care is another uh, non-for-profit company. They operate out of Palm Beach and Broward County. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there are some resources, but the dollars are, are short and, and, you know, there's a lot of need. Does a person or a family get to choose who they wish to be a guardian if it's not a family guardian? Do they have a choice in that? You know, it, it, sometimes if they're really not clicking with an emergency temporary guardian, they can ask and say, look, I really don't like this person. I would really like to have somebody else step in. Okay. And they can do that. Uh, it doesn't happen often. As a matter of fact, I met with a gentleman as a care manager um, subsequently, he needs a guardian. There's someone else put in place as an emergency temporary guardian, and he's not happy with that. So I think when they go to court next month, uh, there's going to be a conversation of, can they place me in that position instead? I would not advocate for that. I mean, I'm not a, a shopper that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are circumstances where the court will make an allowance. That's good, though, because at least it, it shows that you do have a choice if Correct. there really is a reason to make right. a switch on that. You know, that. there are many guardians. I, you know, there, there are probably a 1,000 guardians in the state of Florida. So, you know, not every person is the right fit. And some counties have more than others. I know up in Tallahassee area, and that whole northeast, northwest corridor panhandle, mm-hmm. I think for one area, there's three guardians. Wow. To handle, right. So, wow. you know, each county also dictates what they pay their guardians. Not not every county, each county sets their own rates By and the determination, right? Wow. And some only allow you to bill for your fees every six months instead of, you know, when we get paid every three months, every six months, not weekly, not monthly like most people. So, yeah, it's a lot goes into this. Well, right. we're going to take our last commercial break, and when we come back, Karen's going to share a little bit more with us, and uh, stay tuned because this is good stuff, everybody. We'll be right back. Law attorney, but perhaps find it difficult or overwhelming getting to appointments? The solution? is the Elder Law Department. We bring Elder Law to you by meeting with you in the comfort of your own surroundings to discuss your situation and family needs. 
In practice since 1994, Heidi Friedman is a member of the Elder Law section of the Florida Bar. She and her team help families with issues that include incapacity and estate planning, asset preservation, veterans benefits, and other legal issues that seniors may face. Call the Elder Law Department at 954-383-1143. 954-383-1143. They bring elder law to you. Arden Courts is not just a place to live. It's a place to call home. Residential living combined with quality caregiving. This is the philosophy behind Arden Courts. Communities created exclusively for individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementia who would benefit from a safe and structured environment. For additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides, call 888-478-2410. To locate a community nearest you, inquire about our educational seminars, resource library, they have about all related dimensions. At Arden Courts, no, we understand and we can help because memory care is all we do. Remember, call 888-478-2410 for additional information about any of the unique services Arden Courts provides. You are listening to your host, Marsha Teal, an Alzheimer's disease and dementia care expert on caregiversolutions.info. If you have a question or wish to share a story, call into the show at 888-565-1470 talk talk with Marsha. Now, back to Caregiver Solutions. And we are back with Caregiver Solutions Info. We're talking about guardianship and what it is, what it means, who gets involved, when do you need it. And Karen Green is here with us. Thank you again, Karen, for being here today. Karen is a professional guardian, and she has her own company called Hired Hearts. And tell me about Hired Hearts. I know you're a little different in the fact that you're not only a professional guardian but you're also a nurse and as a nurse you're also a care manager so you kind of have a twofer there you know and tell me about that and how you integrate the two and give me some scenarios about how you help people on a daily basis and what's a typical day for you as a guardian typical day as a guardian could be anything you know you wake up in the morning you say this is the way my day is going to look and then it looks nothing like that so there is no typical you never day know. okay no typical day <laughs> you know have day. a plan throw it out the window um you know care management i started off nursing i wanted to advocate for people so i quickly um upon completing my nursing uh, courses i stepped into the role of of advocating and created a company i thought i was going to be so original and be a care manager and an advocate, and uh, then I realized that there were other people that were doing that, and it's a wonderful field, and it's very fulfilling, and I love making a difference. Um, and then several years later, I realized the need for guardianship. I was working with attorneys in care management role, and I said, you know what? I really want to do this, too. I want to take it that next level and be the decision maker instead of providing the information to the family. In a care management role, I really feel like I can advocate more. So I stepped in and took the course and moved forward with guardianship. Wow. that I, I love that because you can um, add so much more to a ward's life with your knowledge and your expertise that you have and everything that you do for somebody. So tell us, um, if somebody wanted to talk to you further, if they wanted to ask you more questions, how would they contact you? Give them a number and let them know how they can reach you. Well, I have a website, HiredHearts.com. That's a great place to reach me. And I have um, a local phone number of 561-432-7800. 561-432-7800. You know, guardianships are initiated with the first phone call. You know, sometimes there's a situation where adult protective services comes out, um, where they're in a hospital and there's an emergent need. So, you know, guardianships can, can come from all different areas and all different ways. And, you know, if you see your neighbor who is inappropriate, maybe walking in the street, not clothed properly, um, not caring for themselves, not caring for their home, their animals, their people, their things. You know, if you have questions, please go to the proper authorities. It never hurts to make a report. You know, contact the family. Okay, if you know the family, if they have family. If not, would they call the police? Would they call 
Adult they could. Protective Services. Who, Absolutely. And just reach out. Right, exactly. Reach out to You know, if you're genuine mm -hmm. and there's no malicious intent, the reports are always appreciated. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know what? We all need to watch out for our elderly, watch out for each other. It's a community. It's a community. And, and I think that we all, um, you know, can sometimes get in our own little bubble and dealing with our own stuff. Right. And we have to be aware of others. Mm -hmm. um, we had a couple, was it last week, two weeks ago, we had Lost on Foot. And we had Sylvia here talking about how her husband had gone Lost on Foot. And we were talking about the process, calling the law enforcement. And do you know, the very next day after this show aired, Sylvia called me at the office at Arden Course and she said, guess what? My neighbor just came over. Well, my neighbor um, has her husband who has dementia and the aide came knocking on her door. Have you seen Irving? Have you seen Irving? And all of a sudden, Irving was lost on foot. Oh. And it was her neighbor across the street. She had just talked, told her story, right. and they actually had to, um, you know, call 911 right now. So right. thank you, Karen, for being on the show. I want to let you all know this is the time to get your pen and pencil. You want to call Arden Courts at 888-478-2410. That's 888-478-2410. Ask about the 36-hour day book. Give them your name, address. They will be happy to mail one directly to your home. And I want you to please share this show with everybody that you know that could benefit from it because we have awesome people like Karen that come on and share with us, and it's so important. And so tune in next week, same time, same place. And in the meantime, don't forget, give somebody a hug. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us for this week's Caregiver Solutions with Marsha Teal. Join us next week as Marsha, who has 15 years of Alzheimer's disease and dementia care experience, brings you more needed information to help with the care of your loved one. This show can be seen again on caregiversolutions.info and questions can be left on the site, which may be used on the program to help others. See you next week for more Caregiver Solutions. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors.